bigger is better. I do not believe that Alcoholics Anonymous works on the bigger is better proposition. I believe Alcoholics Anonymous works best at an intimate level, one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, gathered up, trying to discuss this stuff, hammer it out. The best example. I've attended meetings where, you know, obviously you go to the international, the big, uh, the big uh, meeting is 50,000 people. And sometimes the best ones are the ones where I'm sitting there alone mad at the world because nobody showed up at my group. <laughs> but I'm there alone with me and all my demons, and I've got to sit there and do nothing but read literature for an hour and pour out coffee. <laughs> because I'm an optimist. <laughs> I think everybody should come. <laughs> and they don't always show up, you know. And, uh, you know, there's, 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 just, there's just a lot that goes on. And so we get sober, and we, we're five years sober, and we're seven, and we're nine years sober. And we wake up one morning and it's like a bolt of lightning and it's a, the question comes and it says, is this all there is? Yeah. I'm helping guys. I'm doing this. What's in it for me? When's the paybacks come? God, I forgot. I need to get an education. So single purpose, <laughs> we go to have an education then we forget that we belong to an AA group. And we forget that, you know, that uh, the primary purpose of the exercise is to, is to help the other alcoholics. So all of a sudden, then four years later, we wake up one day and we go, geez, I haven't been to AA in four years. I'm not too bad. I'm doing okay. I'm okay. And the next thing you know, we read about it. You know, and it's, it's not pretty. I'm not saying that happens all the time, but I'm saying it happens more often than not. I can't do anything about people that, are, that think like that. I can't do anything. Uh, I, I, don't, I hope I'm not the last man standing in this thing. And I hope I'm not the one that has to turn the lights out when it's all over. You know, one of the greatest fears that I've had in my whole life, and it's because I lived my whole life this way, was I was a loner. And I did it my way or the highway. And I did things and said things and, and I put myself and painted myself in the corner. And I've done it in sobriety. And um, it's always been power, property, or prestige that led me to the doors. But the bottom line is uh, I was promised this one thing, and that is that I never had to go alone ever again. Now, I don't want to have to go back to the big meeting and tell those guys, you lied. You know what I mean? And maybe, maybe somebody else has some feeling or sentiment on that. Don probably does. <laughs> <laughs> My little group's been pretty successful. we got about 20 members now. And everybody's carrying their load. we got some extra money now. What are we going to do with it? Well, let's have a little party. Just a little one. We'll, Tom's got a birthday coming up. We'll have a birthday celebration for Tom. What do we get? Chocolate cake? I don't like chocolate cake. <laughs> I want strawberry ice cream and vanilla cake. I don't like cake at all. I don't think we ought to be wasting our money on cake, for God's sake. I don't even like Tom. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a birthday celebration. Can my wife come? No, it's a closed group. Well, screw you. I'm coming back. I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but I've been there with this. This is, I'm quoting from a variety of experiences here. Uh, early on, the, the whole idea was we'll get this book. That'll get us lots of money because we'll sell stock at 25 bucks a share. The book costs us 35 cents to print. We can sell it for three and a half. We can get some bucks here. And with them bucks, we can open up a string of drying out places in hospitals for drunks. And I'll get a good salary from that, of course. Set all that up. And... Uh, <coughs> It was pretty well ironed out that that just wasn't going to work at all. That group, well, we got Rule 62. They really had a deal with it. <coughs> Meeting rooms on the first floor, and lawyers on the second floor, and drying out on the third floor. <laughs> who knows what's going on on the fourth floor. <laughs> and, uh, it was the old boy that sold a 13-week series of What is Alcoholics Anonymous to an insurance company for a radio show. And uh, yeah. Bill Nolan, Bill says, 
You can't do that. He said, yeah, you watch me. I've already got the contract. <laughs> of course, Bill stopped it by mentioning that should you go on the air with that, we'll just notify all the groups to listen, and all the members of the AA will write your insurance company, sponsor, and tell them what we thought of that. <laughs> we decided we ought not do that. I've seen squabbles with, with clubs, and clubs became necessary because we outgrew the living room. This is a successful deal. Eventually, you got to get out there in the public. My home group meets now. We started in a classy place. Marty's Loft down at Wazi on the 14th. <laughs> Fufu coffee, leather chairs. I was wondering. <laughs> we outgrew it both by, by numbers and by spirit. We had to get out to the public. So they, they put together some little clubs, and it was all exciting at the beginning. If you haven't heard Bill's three legacy talk, please listen to it. It's wonderful. The folks cleaned it up, and they took care of things, and, and then they started he and she in on the weekends, and nobody would clean it up, and nobody would make the coffee. Eventually, the, it gets dull. So they decided what they needed was a caretaker to the place. So they went out to the they had a, an old retired fireman in a mental institution there. And uh, they'd let him go if he had a place, so Bill and the boys offered him, here's what we'll do. You take care of the place, and we'll give you room and board. And he says, the hell you say? He says, what you guys want is a slave. You want a janitor. You want me to be a janitor? You pay me janitor's wages. I don't do 12-step work for nothing. We learned a lesson for that. But the problem came because now we've got this property. <coughs> uh, and the groups meet in this property. In one case that I can remember, one affluent member, out of the goodness of his heart, it was well-intentioned, bought a place. Had a mortgage on it, bought a place, meeting rooms downstairs, meeting rooms upstairs. And... Uh, Pretty soon, in order to get anything done there, we tried to get a particular meeting started there. Well, we got to ask him first. And then the squabbles began to happen over who could come and who couldn't. And we got to ask him first. And the ownership was there. So early on, they learned that in order to overcome that, we ought to separately incorporate all these places and make them such that if the groups don't like them, they can just walk off from them. They don't own anything. We don't... We used to own our own coffee cups, but we got them from the Salvation Army in a nickel a cup anyway, so you throw them away and wouldn't hurt anything. We don't want to own anything. In my personal life, that has given me incredible freedom. I really don't own much of anything. It's all in my wife's name. <laughs> hey, it keeps me on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea is that I don't want me personally or the group or a to ever be obliged to anyone or anything and if we don't own anything we can't be obliged we can't argue about it what color shall we paint it today Man, you want a six-week group conscience? Yeah. <laughs> Shall we get carpet? Should be simple, not among us. What kind? What color? How much? Who puts it in? Who pays for it? Blah, blah, blah. And in the meantime, the meeting gets set aside. Our primary purpose gets overcome. We begin to separate and argue with each other. The son of a bitch would just be reasonable. What's wrong with green? <laughs> and we forget what's going on. So it's a, it's a very good thing. Uh, if I don't own anything, I can't be owned by it. If, if I'm willing to let you have it, I won't argue with it. You want to take it. I didn't have it when I got it. And I know where there's another one just like it anyway. <laughs> I can't be owned by things if I don't own anything. The group can stay focused. I have, uh, one of the ways I mark my effectiveness is by the quality of my enemies. It's, it's not a bad <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> 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 
And I've got some really high quality enemies, so I'm doing pretty good. One of them, he and I really just don't like each other. He came to me and made amends to me one time because of all the ugly things he's been saying about me. Before he got to know me and wanted to know what to do to straighten that out, I said, let's go have lunch and get to know each other. And over lunch, we discovered we don't like each other. <laughs> the best thing we can do is just a quick howdy doody and move on down the road. But there have been three occasions when he and I, through circumstances, had to do a 12-step call together. And we're right on the money. All the way through. Five minutes later, it's bye-bye. But during that, we can stay on because it's the application of the same. I don't want anything to do with it. Person, he didn't want anything to do with me personally, and I'm so glad. <laughs> but we must be able to work together, because I promise you this: if I ever say I won't, that's the next thing God's going to ask me. <laughs> I just know it. I just I can't stand it. Again, get that order now. I'm not a hell of a word for <clears throat> We have a couple of things uh, to consider. First of all, we have some people here from our Spanish district who are Spanish speaking, so we're going to do, through the loving help of one of our attendees, an attempt at a simultaneous translation. We'll see how that goes. It means we've got to go slower, at least in the way we talk, for sure. And probably means we ought to tighten it up a little bit, or we're we're going to uh, end up at the seventh tradition at seven o'clock. Right. But we'll do what it takes to get through this. First, uh, also, uh, is there any Lou? Is Lou around? Does he have any announcements from that end of it? Oh, that's that's a good point. I've been asked, uh, some people have asked uh, as to whether or not uh, they could ask questions without having to get to the mic. Uh, that would be preferable, but, uh, that you go to the mic, but in the event we can't do that, if you want to put it on down on a piece of paper or something and ask a question, we'll do our best to try to slip it in at some point, I guess. And uh, is there any other questions from the, <coughs> the gathering before we move on? Concerns? How about if you just repeat the question quickly and paraphrase it? Uh, okay. Well, we can try to do that, too. If you'll ask questions and not make 15-minute talks. Yeah. <laughs> you mean regular questions? <laughs> regular questions. David. Good morning. This is David. I'm now Paul. Hey, David. Hey, David. My question for the distinguished panel is this. From your experience, uh, can you talk about groups that have no formal group conscience and how they fare? The question is uh, <coughs> groups that do not have a formal group conscience, and I assume you mean a regular meeting dedicated to that purpose, how they, how they do. Uh, Don, you want to take that? No, but I will. <laughs> no, over the years I've just watched, and there's no general thing on it. But generally, they don't do well. Things begin to deteriorate. One of the things that occurs, Chuck brought up, they begin to accumulate too much money for one thing, uh, serious money, and then somebody steals it. That's the nature of the beast. Uh, well, it is. We lost, what, 10,000 out of one group in Dallas? And Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Yeah. When, when we get, it's just one of the areas that if the group doesn't take care of its business, somebody will. <laughs> yeah. $120,000. The accumulation is... Well, if, if, there's, if there's no connection to anything... We don't need money except to pay our basic expenses. And beyond that, it accumulates really rapidly. And let's see, 
She just invested it in the stock market, right? The treasurer just put it in stock. In her name. In her name. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> well, you know the play on that one. The money can go back in the group's treasury and she makes all the excess. Nobody, nobody's the wiser. I've been down that road. The, uh, it, it, it's a hard one to answer, but the, 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 the spirit of the meeting, from what I've seen, seldom is very strong either. There's no general purpose to it. The group doesn't know why they're there. It's hard to answer because it, they just don't do well. No direction, no guidance. God doesn't speak. And that's the purpose of group consciousness is to finally hear the voice of God. We talked earlier on when we were talking about the second tradition, we asked the question of how is God going to reveal himself through a group conscience? You know, if there's no forum, how does that work? And sometimes the, the revelation is that God doesn't reveal himself and apathy sets in. <clears throat> that is the conscience of the group. It's de facto. It doesn't necessarily mean everybody voted. Let's just be lazy. But by not voting, by not participating, that is their action. Okay. And in my mind, what a group does is the group conscience. Not what they say, not how they vote, but what they do. Any other questions? All right. We're at Tradition 7, I guess. Huh? <laughs> we had an event here in Colorado, speaking of the accumulation of money. We've had several. One, the one I remember is we had an area assembly, and at that time we fronted fifteen hundred dollars to it, and it was supposed to come back. Oh, it didn't come back. It seems to have disappeared. And in checking that out, I was delegate at the time. Uh, it was laid off on the new people that had been put on the committee had run off with it. Well, that was garbage. We know who got it. So at the next assembly, the question was posed by our chairman: What are we going to do about this? And Don Burrow, one of our elders, says, we're going to do nothing about it. It's our fault this happened. Yeah. We'll do nothing about it. We didn't set up the proper procedures to stop it from occurring. Yeah. So we all learned a great lesson from that. We had been careless. And the guy that was allegedly responsible for it was my delegate buddy at the conference. <laughs> that right? From Arizona? Well, he was one of the team. Yeah. <laughs> it was love is what caused it. Love, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that part of the story. <laughs> Tradition 78, groups themselves ought to be fully supported by the voluntary contributions of their own members. We think that each group should soon achieve this ideal, that any public solicitation of funds using the name of Alcoholics Anonymous is highly dangerous whether by groups, clubs, hospitals, or other outside agencies that acceptance of large gifts from any source or of contributions carrying any obligation of whatever is unwise. And to review with much concern those treasuries which continue beyond prudent reserves to accumulate funds for no stated AA purpose. Experience has often warned us that nothing can so surely destroy our spiritual heritage as feudal disputes over power, or I'm sorry, property, money, and authority. They're those uh, things, again, that, that tend to get in our way. Uh, and, of course, hey, it, you know, if you look back through history in AA, it's rife with all kinds of uh, enterprising alcoholics and fundraising endeavors. Uh, one of the icons in, uh, in Denver actually was started with money that came from an outside agency, and the, and the money was actually solicited in the AA name, and Bill visited in 51, and they said they kind of went like this to him. <coughs> And uh, he said, well, I guess it's working. There wasn't much you could say at that point because it was a done deal. The traditions weren't official at that time, I guess, the time that they were doing it. So everybody kind of took a lame <laughs> approach that, well, the traditions didn't really matter. So here we are. I believe that the, uh, I think a lot of times when we talk about this tradition, we end up talking primarily about money, but I think it's more than money. Uh, the contributions that, that can help make a group go or go, oftentimes boil down to time, effort, love, and labor. And um, there is no, there's no shortcuts for, for those things. 
And I think oftentimes maybe we can't contribute time, maybe we can't contribute effort, we can't contribute love, and we can't contribute labor, so we throw money at the problem. And I don't know that that's self-support. I think that that's almost trying to assuage our guilt. And I'll be real honest with you, I think that that's happened a lot in this, in our area, in Colorado, and I know a lot of you are not from Colorado. But um, we have a fund that's designed to put literature in our correctional facilities. And I think sometimes rather than commit the time to take a meeting in, we throw money at it and we just let the literature carry the message. And I don't believe that the literature itself carries the message. I think it's really nice when we have somebody that's willing to not only extend a book, but a hand with that book. Because uh, it was pointed out to me real early that if a guy's thirsty and comes to us, we shouldn't give him a book on how to drill a water well. And that if they're hungry and come to us, we shouldn't get them a book on how to grow an organic garden. And if they come to us for sobriety, we shouldn't just give them a book on, on how to live sober. That it, you know, it involves a little bit more than that. So, The fundamental of the tradition, of course, is that if we're going to support our services, we need to support our services financially. If we expect somebody to do something that's going to cost some money, we ought to pony up for it. It should not come out of anybody's pocket. Spiritually, we stay fit by not taking anybody else's money. Okay? It's a wondrous thing. Old Wes Perry was telling us his favorite time of the year each year down in Pompano Beach was when the uh, United Fund was divvying up his money to the different organizations and they'd call him up and he was able to say, no thank you, we don't take any money. It just did something to his heart <laughs> to be able to turn them down. Yeah. In my home, we're all self-supporting through our own contributions and sometimes that isn't just money. In order to be part of anything, I must have a part of whatever that is. I have to be an integral part of it. And even the little kids, if I tell them it's your job now, you take out the trash, they get pissed. But if we make the trash one of the contributions, then they fight over who gets to go do that. Do you know what I'm saying? And we've got this big lie we tell. It's a wondrous lie. You can stay sober setting up chairs and doing coffee. No, you can't. But you won't drink while you're doing that, so there's some truth to it. One of my favorite people was a nasty little man. Well, that's who I get. He hated everybody and God. He, he really hated God. He said he couldn't wait till he got his two minutes with him down the road so he can tell him what he thought of this shitty deal. And then he was going to go to hell where all of his friends were. But he really hated everybody <clears throat> along the way. He'd been in AA eight years and drank, and he'd had several two-year things. The big book worked. Nothing worked. He just hated everybody. But he liked me for some reason, because all I did was listen to him while I hated everybody. <laughs> I didn't try to fix him. Anyway, we were at a meeting one night, and someone's son had just started using again and was in danger of dying, and she wasn't feeling good. And she was ranting a little bit about AA and then began to get personal and eventually attacked me simply because I was the chairperson. And I saw him come up out of his chair and he was trying to be quiet. He couldn't do it. And uh, he, he finally stuttered and then he said, oh, screw you, lady. And <laughs> he's out the door and I know he's going to go drink. And that's our deal. He reserved the right to drink one more time. He said, if it doesn't work this time, I will drink myself to death, and I reserve that right. And that's where he's headed, and I know that. And I've agreed I won't stop you. A couple of people from the group did go with him. Now, he and I had taken on the job of setting up the meeting and doing the coffee. And his job this particular night, he graduated to being able to make coffee on his own. It took about six weeks to get him to do it right, but he's finally doing it right. And after the meeting, he kind of staggered back in, mumbling. Went back and cleaned up all the coffee and got that put away. And then on the ride home, he says, you know, I was on the way to drink. I said, I know. He said, and I got to thinking, well, 
I made that coffee, I ought to at least clean it up. So I come back in for that. And while I was doing the coffee, it hit me. This is my job. This is my group. I'm not letting that bitch run me out of here. So I'm scared. Okay. Now that's spiritual. He had a connection. His own contribution, the only contribution he could make, made him a part of the group. So uh, I, I, I saw that in action. Uh, and I've already gone over with you kind of how we do that at home. Everybody has a contribution to make, even the baby. The baby's contribution is to mess up the house. And he's really good at it. <laughs> really good at it. And to make us all laugh with joy. Yeah. But to, I don't want to belabor that. Just think about the contributions we make. My main contribution in service is the most difficult one of all. Right or wrong, I must speak up. My job is to stand up, speak up, and then shut up. And, that's, and the hard part is the shutting up part. Tom and I have been through that together. Tuesday night, general service conference, there's always a little group of delegates out in the hall going, God damn, why did I leave my home for this? They're making their contribution. They're saying what all the rest of us are afraid to say. You know, let's go home. This thing stinks. What in the world did I leave all the family for this for? What are some of the contributions you make? Talk to me about this. I think this is so critically important. Self-support is what we're about. Can somebody input that? What's one of the contributions you think you can make? Me? Yeah. Uh, I'm Jim Finley. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Jim, can you get to the mic? Sure. Uh, I think for me... Um, as we talked about earlier, the time is really important. Um, I spent some time at the Channel 9 Health Fair yesterday sitting behind the AA booth representing our, our fellowship, and uh, I'm scheduled to go to the jail tomorrow night, and you know those little things uh, genuinely make me feel good inside because I can spend a little time doing that. And, and other than that, just the small service commitments, you know, the GSR, and I, I'm at the district level, I'm the uh, PI person right now, and I've done the <laughs> BCM and GSR stuff, so it's just all part of the fulfillment of this uh, fellowship. So that's. Reed Edgar made a contribution to me that was immeasurable. When I was in that prison group, <clears throat> you outsiders would come in on a regular basis. And I remember one fellow came in, gave one hell of a talk. I don't remember a word of it. I just know it was filled with passion and it was great. And we all went back to ourselves feeling good. Never saw him again. Reed came once a month, every month. Very quiet. Did the job. And he's the one I went to when I got out because there was continuity there. His, his contribution was regularity and continuity. He showed me commitment without ever talking about it. He showed it to me. And he's the one I went to because that's what I wanted. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm an alcoholic uh, from DCM, from District 24. I got sober in uh, July of 1987. And um, this money issue always seems to be a big deal in the district level. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to just make an observation and get some feedback about the idea of um, how groups and districts support GSO because um, I've become more aware of how groups really do feel like they need to be autonomous and self-support, self-supporting <clears throat> on the group and local level. But there, there's been a trend for less and less groups to contribute to GSO to make sure that that uh, you know our world services are being supported, which provides a service that no one group could provide. That we, I think, we really need to pay attention that we have this. Um, central office, national or worldwide central office that we can call and get support and, and questions answered and and literature made and that kind of thing. Um, in our district, I noticed that a few groups don't contribute at all to to GSO. Um, they, they sometimes <coughs> contribute to the district level, but they really do support a lot on the intergroup level 
um, and in their own group. Um, whenever, whenever it seems like money comes up and we bring up this tradition about being self-supporting, people want to make that sort of, this is my, this is our money. And, we, and I understand that there's a group conscience for the group to decide how they want to divvy up that money. That's fine. But um, when fewer and fewer groups contribute to GSO, there's a certain worry. We haven't been self-supporting for GSO as Alcoholics Anonymous for, I think, 10 years or something like that, and we're only surviving through the sales of our books. And I don't think a lot of people know that. So this tradition is a good concept, but it's not actually being carried out in practice. Um, this year, our revenues, I think, were up, but there were fewer groups contributing. I mean, they were okay in the world services, but... Could you speak to that as to why that trend seems to be going on and what you think we might be able to do about it on a local level? I'm not sure it's even a trend. Historically, between 48 and 54 percent of the groups are all to send anything in ever. They all want full services, but it runs right around. It averages about half the groups make a contribution. We've only been self-supporting once in our entire history. Uh, the rest of the time it's all come from book sales, which is a great danger. It's also a violation of our spiritual principle because the bulk of our books are sold to other agencies. Hazelden, CompCare. So that, 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 yeah, that money is coming from another source. Uh, I don't know quite, we've done battle with this for years as to how to, when Ed Price was treasurer here and I was chair, we visited the groups and he, in a two year effort, and Ed did a wonderful job brought it all the way up to 53% of the groups from 49, a 4% increase over a two-year period. I don't think there's an answer to it. I think we're... I would love to see it happen. One of the things that will happen if we ever got fully self-supporting, our literature could be had for cost. Uh, it's still the lowest priced book on the market. But can you imagine getting all this stuff for cost? We could actually support ourselves. Uh, of course, the part of the problem with having a high-priced book, it seems like over $4, everybody that's got desktop publishing decides to get in business. And there's, there's, there's probably, uh, that I know of, six or seven different versions of our big book out there right now. And um, we had a deal in principle at one time in, uh, with Hazelden that Hazelden would agree not to publish the big book if the price stayed at X. I don't even know what the amount was, and I know it was subject to a lot of variables. And we've, we've exceeded that price more than once, and Hazelden, for whatever reason, has decided not to publish. But um, when I was delegate, we had to fight with and wrestle with the loss of the circle and triangle logo we also had to wrestle with the chip business and the chips. There was a motion put before the conference to let Grapevine start building chips. We had an ad hoc committee report that came back that said that the <coughs> Alcoholics Anonymous groups in Canada and North America in effect financially subsidized the chip business to the tune of $6.4 million a year. 80% of the chip market is AA groups. That same year, they contributed $3.8 million to GSO. In the groups, here's what I heard from that. It's about me. That's what I heard. This was about me. After all these years, it's still about me and my little metal. So, we have a we have in effect financed an outside industry and this is AA members that do these generally. Isn't that ridiculous? I have an opinion about this. It's pretty clear what it is. You know the tradition clearly defines how to solve this. It talks about voluntary contributions for stated AA purposes. One of the reasons a lot of groups don't contribute is that they don't know what they're contributing to. What is the purpose of this? Where does this money go? What does it supply? And I, this, this pink can thing, I absolutely adored that when Bruce brought that in here. 
At the time, our our area budget, total area budget was $28,000, give or take a penny or two. And the first year the paint cans went out, they collected $14,000 because it had a it was a voluntary contribution. The deal was you don't pass this can; it just sits there, and we tell people what it's about. And it had a stated AA purpose. I think now we've gone berserk. We have way too much money coming in from it, but that's a different story. But if we will let the folks know what this is for, why are you putting this money in the basket? And don't get caught in the trap that it used to be a dollar, now put in two. The whole dollar doesn't go to GSO anyway. And I don't want anybody telling me how much to put in that basket because I'm, let's, let's take this scenario. I'm new. I've come to you and you told me there's no dues or fees and there's no rules or no nothing to do here. Then you tell me I've got to make 90 meetings in 90 days. Or some groups say that. That's not A, by the way. And then I watch at the end of the meeting without any explanation whatsoever. Somebody starts a basket and I'm watching everybody throw a dollar in there. And I don't have enough for dinner tonight. And it doesn't take a genius to know that in 90 days this thing's going to cost me 90 bucks. And I don't have any money now anyway. Goodbye. I don't know how many of you are aware that we don't hold the copyright on the big book. That's why it's so easy to get to. We lost that in 1967 through a strange fluke in the law. The, uh, when the second edition was published, we <coughs> copyrighted it, and the assumption was that renewed the copyright to the first edition, which it did in Canada, but not in the United States. It was a fluke. So in 67, it went into the public domain, and we didn't even know it. And then in uh, 85, this 2,500 copies of the original first edition big book show up as a commemorative to be sold in Montreal at 25 bucks a crack. And we jumped hard and said, cease and desist. He said, I don't have to. You don't own the copyright. And he was right. We don't. Anybody who wants to, all the material in the first edition big book is in the public domain. And if we rely upon that for our income, we are now in deep trouble because I can pull it right off the internet. It doesn't cost me a dime. I can change it. And some people are. <laughs> okay. Aren't they? Yeah. We need to get self support. Spiritually, I don't feel right if I'm leeching. If I'm making my own contribution, then I can stand pat on what I believe and you can't budge me. I've made my contribution. This is this is our deal. We don't need your damn money. And, and I also come from the old school that says if AA is going to have a function and they don't support it on their own, then don't have the function. Okay? Don't use dance money to support an AA function. Don't use banquets to support an AA function. They ought to be self-supporting by themselves. And if they're not, don't have them. Tom? Well, on that note, could both of you uh, possibly uh, address the issue of the international conference uh, receiving donations from the host city. I will make only one contact. A kickback is a kickback. <coughs> and I think we're dead wrong. Absolutely dead wrong. It's a standard business procedure. This is not a standard business. Just my own viewpoint. Could you explain what we're talking about for the benefit of those who don't know? Yeah. In... Uh, San Diego, the city of San Diego rebated us $150,000 if we would have our convention there. It's a bribe. That's a kickback. We still lost $185,000 or $165,000. Yeah. With that? So uh, and, uh, we lost in Minneapolis, there. they have rebated a certain amount of the fee to us so we would hold it there. Kickback's a kickback. If you want to bring us in, lower the fee. In Denver, what we did... They provided bus transportation. Okay. We thought that was okay. It sounds reasonable. That's still that's an inducement they wouldn't give anybody else. I think we're in trouble heading that direction, Tom. Uh, if we can't support it, then we ought not have it. But there's a it's more fundamental. A kickback's a kickback. I uh 
You said be straight, David. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I sort of feel uh, that uh, we've almost reached a point where there is such a tremendous financial clout that goes with an international convention. And the money thing, I'm talking for the netherworld, I'm not talking about us, has to go the right way or these things don't happen. The, uh, the Alcoholics Anonymous Convention is one of the largest single conventions that's possible in the world in which we live. And it's also one of the most sought after. There's, there's huge financial incentives for cities to have us. Uh, but we operate with a set of principles that the rest of the world doesn't operate by. How do we make that mix? And that's really, you know, if we talk about this in the concepts, that's really what what we got to do. We've got to mix the spiritual and the material somehow. I think we're not asking the right questions. I think we're not being presented the right information in a form in which we can generally understand it. I think there's too much vested interest in certain factions of our, of our Alcoholics Anonymous Fellowship that are capable of willing to cover up a bad motive with a good motive. And I'm not talking about just trustees or anything, anybody in particular. Uh, there were some people that had some huge personal interest in having a convention at a specific site uh, for this last one, and that's going to be in Minneapolis as well as uh, the upcoming one. And it has it has contributed, in my opinion, to disunity within Alcoholics Anonymous. The minority will not cease and desist. Uh, I believe it's not just the bantering of a vocal minority. I believe they are trying to get the principle nailed down, but they're just not quite there yet. So it means we're not done talking about it. It also means that uh, we may have to ask ourselves some serious questions about whether or not we can even continue to have it. Whether we will get the honest enough to do it. You can say that word too. <laughs> I don't know. That I can't Let me pose this because I do believe we need to revisit everything on a regular basis. So just consider this. He hit on it. Do we still need an international convention? Is it actually serving the fellowship? Now, I did the numbers and it serves about 2% of the total fellowship. That's what it serves uh, at best. And the effort and the money and the divisiveness brings me to that same question. Do we still need it? And if we do, and I'm quite, I'm not saying we don't, maybe it's time we had a genuine international convention. Maybe so, I don't know. Maybe England ought to host it next time. Maybe Japan the year after that. Maybe Australia. Maybe we need a real international convention. I don't know. But these are ideas that can be pursued unless we get lazy. Uh, on the other side of it, I've been to three of them. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Great experience. Everybody ought to go. I'm not going this time. I can't support it. And I don't need that many people anymore. So. Before we uh, go on, I've been asked if there's apparently some people that are having problems hearing while we're doing the simultaneous translation. I need some guidance from the group how we want to proceed with this. Is, it, is everybody having problems hearing back there in the back? Is this getting confusing? No, no, no. Are you able to keep up with us? We're really good. This this thrills me, by the way. I can't tell you. So we're we're doing okay. Move over here. Move over here. Move over here. Move over well, they're doing that. Well, when I, I had the privilege of going to Russia for you all in 1988. 84. Something like, yeah, 88, November 88. They don't speak English too well. So we took a translator, and he was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. Because Vlad is a, a simultaneous translator. One word went in here, and another one came out here, different languages. And one of the things that occurred there is, in the personal experience, particularly at the AA meeting in Moscow, a Russian 
person would speak. And then he stopped while the translation went on. And I found that gave me time to consider what he had said. While he was saying his next thing, I went to me. And it was a real, slowed down, meaningful experience. 